Welcome to the Navy. The Navy is an acronym standing for Never Again Volunteer Yourself. As a senior in high school, I was so fed up with school, there was absolutely no way I was going to college. Between my parents and school counselors, I was always pushed into math and science classes beyond my interest and what was required for graduation. I was burned out and earning D's in these classes by my senior year. I was so fed up with academics that I didn't even take the SATs with the rest of my class. I was through with school. There were a lot more productive uses for my time. In fact, Orlin Lovern and I had already talked to a Navy recruiter and he gave us pamphlets describing the various Navy career paths. I picked two that sounded the most fun, bosun's mate and gunner's mate. And the recruiter, and told the recruiter, that's what I wanted. Oh no, you don't want those choices. Those are for idiots. Look at your test scores. You're highly intelligent. You should go into the nuclear power program. You make rank faster and you get more money. I couldn't even feel the barbed hook as it pierced my jaw. Yeah, sign me up, baby. I ignored the fine print where it said I belonged to Uncle Sam for the next six years. We graduated high school on June 11th. With diplomas in hand, we raced down to the recruiter's office on the 15th to enlist. We didn't even wait to see where our birth dates came up in the draft lottery. We didn't care about Vietnam or that old crazy Asian war that Kenny Rogers was singing about. We were bulletproof. We were going to blow this backwater town. The recruiter told us that we could ship out to boot camp together on the buddy program. One of our classmates, Pat Atherton, had already joined the army and was regaling us with stories of adventure. We couldn't wait. The recruiter took us up to the AFI station in Fresno for our physicals, where I passed, but surprise, Orlin didn't. Plan B, you're on your own, boy. Since I had to wait until my 18th birthday in November, I had the whole summer off, but no money. So I drove up to Humboldt County and worked for Andy McBride again as a ranch hand. The previous summer, David and I had worked for Andy on our way to Alaska. This time was a little different. I got to be Bob's roommate in the bunkhouse. Wahoo! A moody roommate I could hardly understand when he smoke, spoke. At least, it paid wages. However, I was a little homesick by the end of the summer. I returned home with a few weeks to kill before the Navy came knocking, so I hooked up with Leo Silva and took off for Southern California, where he was going to college. When my 18th birthday finally rolled around, the recruiter loads us, his monthly quota, into a van and drives us up to Fresno. We took our oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. They gave us our orders and put us on a bus to boot camp in San Diego. Yeah, really, a bus. What is this, 1941? We have airplanes now, you know. The rooster hadn't finished crowing when we pulled out of Fresno on Greyhound, headed south. My first and last commercial bus ride. We pulled into San Diego around midnight after stopping at every hayseed town between Fresno and San Diego. A harbinger of things to come, perhaps? Hmm. A couple sailors picked us up at the airport in a USO van and dumped us at some sort of transient barracks where we were given a blanket, a pillow, and a bunk. After a 20-hour bus ride, I was unconscious as my head hit the pillow. It was probably 3 a.m. I had just closed my eyes and crash! Some moron had just thrown a trash can across the room and began yelling words I'd never heard. I assumed he wanted us to get up. It was still pitch black outside, which didn't seem to matter to this guy. He herded us outside and over to a chow hall for breakfast. I couldn't have slept for more than an hour. It was still dark, and this idiot wants me to eat breakfast. I was beginning to get a bad feeling. Maybe I had been somewhat rash in this join the Navy thing. After a five-minute breakfast, 
we were headed over to the barbershop. Well, not really a barbershop. It looked more like a sheep shearing shed. Four or five chairs, clippers running full throttle, lines before and after, and piles of hair growing on the floor. I had fooled them, cutting off my hair two days before. I expected to skip this part. Yet, sit down. Somehow they managed to cut some more hair off. Hmm. That bad feeling is getting louder. Next, the herd was prodded and whipped over to the uniform issue warehouse. Everywhere we go, we're in lines. We move one person forward at a time. First thing they give you is a sea bag, so you can put everything that comes next into it. Shoe, nine and a half. Catch, wham! Waist, 28. Long, regular, short. I don't know. Catch, wham! Hat size. I don't know. Catch, wham! After each reply, you best be ready, because some item of clothing will come flying at you. After you have 150 pounds of uniforms stuffed in your 100-pound capacity sea bag, it's over to the next building where you get to stencil your name and social security number on everything. And I mean everything. Now comes the first time today where some performance is required of us recruits. Good performance is not recognized, but bad performance is punished via screaming, name-calling, humiliation, and other usually non-physical forms of abuse. Stay below the radar, don't stand out, speak only when spoken to, and keep your head down. First, you have to make a stencil on this letter punching machine. Then you grab a white and black laundry marker. Ready? Stenciling clothes is not rocket science, but some recruits manage to screw it up. Stenciling their name backwards, upside down, through multiple layers of clothing, wrong color, these idiots stood out in the crowd for extra attention. Next, it's off to our new home, Worm Island. It's called Worm Island because you cross a small bridge to get to it. And for the first three weeks, you are a worm, not a recruit. You even wear a worm hat, a skull-fitting ball cap like the big nerdy bill like Gomer Pyle used to wear at the gas station in Mayberry. After three weeks, you move off the island to the regular recruit barracks and you get to wear the white buttercup hat, hopefully. Worm Island has several barracks, each filled with iron top and bottom bunks and a large toilet shower room. Each barracks also has big concrete wash tables in the courtyard. One of the first things they teach you is how to wash clothes on a cement slab with a scrub brush and a bucket of soapy water. Oh, and those new clothes in your sea bag? They are not clean because they haven't been washed. Yes, I found this out the hard way. You don't just wash your clothes, but the entire company's clothes, production line style. And you hang everything up to dry on a clothesline, not with clothespins, nope. How about small pieces of rope? Really? This is more efficient than using clothespins. How so? Ah, mine is not to question why. The second thing you learn is how to fold your clothes. There's the navy way and the wrong way. And apparently, folding clothes is rocket science because we didn't have anybody who could do it correctly for several days. You're notified of your failure by walking into the barracks and seeing everyone's clothes all over the floor. Oh. And those little wayward threads hanging out of various seams? Irish pennants. Very bad to get caught with one of those unless you like special attention. Every day at Reveille, you're awakened by your company commander in some rude, depressing manner, setting the tone for yet another fun Navy day. Note, a company commander is a guy who can't find a better shore duty assignment, so he ends up pushing boots as we are reverently known. Usually he's a chief, an E7, or a first class, E6, petty officer. After a leisurely shower and shave, maybe a full 10 minutes, it's off to the chow hall at O Dark 30, about a mile away. Oh, I did find out the hard way that shaving is required regardless of whether you have facial hair or not. Transportation to the chow hall, as with everywhere else, 
was close order marching, yet another opportunity for recruit performance failure. In any crowd, there are always some folks with two left feet and no rhythm. Thank God I'm not one of them. These poor sots are singled out for close personal verbal abuse. After chow, we usually get some kind of training, classroom training where we are taught stuff like naval history, customs, shipboard safety, etc. Practical training like phone talking, knot tying, clothes folding, etc. Or close order drilling, which is how to march in formation. The training contains stuff every sailor needs to know because while some of us will head off to more advanced schools after boot camp, others will head directly to the fleet. These folks need some basic tools to acclimate quickly to shipboard life so they can be functional vice a burden. We spent hours marching on a grinder, which is a huge paved parking lot, doing about faces, obliques, and to the rear. Just when we all seem to be going in the same direction, at the same time, at the same speed, they issue everybody a rifle. Whoa! Now we're dangerous to each other. Now we're all marching around, smashing each other in the head with rifle barrels. The rifle muzzles are plugged and non-operational. These are old M1 bolt-action Springfield 30-06s from WW2, but we have to treat them like state-of-the-art weaponry. Each company has a recruit chief petty officer, an RCPO, who carries a saber, walks alongside the company, counts cadence, and gives us orders. He's usually older and has some ROTC experience. Each company also has a guide on who carries the company pennant, which is a flag on a stick, like in the Western cavalry movies. He's usually the flashiest marcher. Ours was Monroe from Louisiana. He was one of the best. Life became a little easier once we moved off Worm Island, and by little, I mean minuscule. Each company spends one week working at the gallery, chow hall. The galley, chow hall, serving meals, wiping tables, assisting cooks, butchers, whatever. We were lucky. We got three weeks because our week fell on Christmas break when most of the other recruits who were further along in their training got to go home. Lucky me. I got to work in the butcher shop for a week where the main work area was kept at a balmy 40 degrees. However, part of your time is spent working inside the freezer. All we had to wear for warmth during boot camp was a light jacket. I froze all week. This is when I began drinking coffee, not because I liked the flavor, but out of self-preservation. On the plus side, I got all the ice cream and frozen cookies I could eat. Another week, I got the bus tables. And the last week, I got to haul the uneaten food scraps, the wet garbage, out to the wet dumpsters. This was tolerable because you could kill time out behind the chow hall throwing half-eaten fried eggs into the air to be snagged by agile seagulls. Three weeks wasted in this hellhole and not a day closer to graduation. So now it's back to the normal training routine. Besides classes, we got free dental. Woohoo! And vaccinations. Ah! -ha! Vaccinations were given in a similar way we vaccinated cattle back on the ranch. Whip all the animals into a single line, drive them through a constricted area where the vaccinators pop them in each arm and throw them out the building. These weren't the old syringe style shots. Nope. These were the modern pneumatic pistol style that forces a serum into your pores by pressure but it felt like someone slugged you in the arm with their fist. Heaven help you if you flinched. On Sundays, we got to attend church if we desired. Oh, and we all desired because the alternative was cleaning something. Mass 0700, Catholics form up. Yep, that's me, I'm Catholic. Protestant services are at 0900, Protestants form up. Yep, I'm Presbyterian. I know, it's hard to believe, but I'm also Jewish. Another thing I noticed early on, our company commander was a smoker. So frequently, 
he would call a smoke break. Smoke them if you got them. The rest of you guys, keep on cleaning. Hey, now I'm a smoker. Where's my cigarettes? Anybody can stand around with a cigarette in their hand. It ain't that hard. The day came to take our swimming test. We were herded over to the pool where we donned our GI swim trunks and lined up near the pool. One by one, we had to jump in, whether we could swim or not. Then, without touching the side, swim, float, dog paddle, or whatever, the length of the pool, across to the other side, and back the length of the pool. There were guys standing along the edge with poles, pushing people along and pulling out the sinkers. I made it! Great! The ones who didn't were called non-swims, mostly Filipinos. They had to wear white tennis shoes, not Chuck Taylors, but the kind your little sister used to wear, and march in a group behind the rest of the company. They also had to attend swim classes until they could pass the test or they were discharged. One night, while polishing our non-functional rifles, I showed a friend of mine, Puzio, a stereotypical New York Jewish guy, how to remove the bolt from his rifle. Cool. He was impressed. I think I was the only one who knew this trick. The next day, we were on the grinder for an inspection with rifles when our company commander orders, Inspection! Arms! And we all open our bolt action for inspection. Old Puzio pulls his boat completely out of his action. He forgot to reset the lever after playing with it last night. The company commander orders, Two! We all close our bolts, except Puzio. The company commander orders, Right shoulder! Arms! We all put our rifles on our right shoulders, except Puzio, who is madly trying to get his bolt back into the action of his rifle. Now he catches the eye of our company commander, who immediately stops everything, walks over to Puzio, slaps him upside the head with an open hand, and says, I told you not to with your rifles. Oh yeah, about rifles. Never point your rifle at a seagull. These idiots learned firearm safety the hard way. They got to stand out on the grinder for an hour, aiming their rifle at every seagull that flew over, while yelling, BANG! at the top of their lungs. And two, never refer to your rifle as your gun. Peace is acceptable, but not gun. These idiots got to stand out on the grinder, next to the seagull killers, thrusting their rifle into the air with one hand, grabbing their crotch with the other hand, and yelling, THIS IS MY RIFLE! THIS IS MY GUN! One is for shooting, the other for fun. Keep a low profile. The most exciting day in boot camp, rifle qualification. After breakfast one morning, we form up and march over to Marine Corps Recruit Training Depot, which abuts Navy Recruit Training Command. I remember sitting in the aluminum bleachers while a couple drill instructors taught us on the M14, interrupted every few minutes by a commercial jet taking off or landing at San Diego Airport next door. For the thousandth time, I'm reminded of the Johnny Cash song, Folsom Prison, and I too wish they'd move it a little further down the line. But cuz, like a Folsom prisoner, I long to be aboard every jet I heard flying overhead instead of this miserable concentration camp. After our outdoor classroom training, we boarded the prison bus, which took us out to the rifle range at Miramar. Freedom! Freedom! However fleeting. We broke into two groups. One group was shooting, while the other group worked the target pits. The M14 was a strange animal to me. A 308 caliber semi-automatic with aperture peep sight. This was the first time I had ever seen a peep sight on a rifle and it was hard to get used to. I believe the targets were about 200 yards downrange with big bullseyes. In the target pits, we were protected by a concrete bunker as we pulled the targets down, marked the shot, and raised it back up. The marker was about two inches in diameter, white on one side and black on the other, with a dowel in the center that fit a 30 caliber hole made by the bullet. You use the black side for shots outside the bullseye in the white 
and the white side, for shots, inside the bullseye, in the black. I remember the crack of the supersonic bullet as it passed overhead, before impacting a dirt bank covered with rusting tungsten bullet cores. When we were finished, it was back on the prison bus and home to lockup. Our training also included firefighting school, which is extremely important when your house floats on water thousands of miles away from land. We learned how to hook up and operate hoses, pumps, valves, foggers, nozzles, water jets, extinguishers, foam, etc. We suited up in a firefighting gear that weighed a ton. They ignited an oil fire inside a training building and sent us in to put it out. The nozzle man was given a breathing apparatus, an OBA, so he could see where he was going and what he was doing. Us hose handlers got zippo, nada, zilch. I tucked my mouth into my shirt neck so I could sort of breathe. I closed my eyes tight and hung on to the inch and a half fire hose as the nozzle man led us into the building to put out the fire. Did I tell you how much I liked boot camp? After firefighting school, it was on to the next prisoner torture exercise, the gas chamber. We were shown how to put on a Mark IV gas mask, which is kind of like sticking an octopus over your mouth and nose while he's ripping out your hair with his tentacles. Everybody got their masks on, our trainer asks with a sly smile? Yes, sir. All right, into the chamber. Of course, he's standing outside watching us through a big picture window and talking via intercom. Sssst. The room becomes foggy as we are gassed with tear gas. The idiots who didn't get their masks on correct are bolting for the door, which is locked. As we stand in formation, the instructor says, Everybody take off your mask and recite your first general order. Result? Incoherent yelling in a cadence resembling some kind of general order, then hacking, wheezing, and crying. The door pops open and we storm out into the fresh air. Isn't boot camp fun? We were a horrible company, old 399. We had all the klutzes, the morons, dropouts, the malcontents, etc. Our sister company, 400, always kicked our butt. We made them look like spit and polish presidential guards. We were last in academics, last in marching, last in clothes washing, and every other measurable thing they give you achievement penance for. Except one, physical fitness, aka the obstacle course. Our company was filled with expert boxers, martial arts masters, and power weightlifters who thought they were pretty hot stuff. These cerebrally challenged athletes were going to show the rest of us little people how to run an obstacle course. Macho man on the course, stand back, Sonny, you might get hurt. When my turn for me came, W's are nearly last in everything, I ran the course like it was something I did all the time. When I finished, the timekeeper called out my time to the recorder. It was just like the time in high school gym class when we were doing the President's Fitness Challenge, or whatever they called it. On this particular day, the event was the softball throw for distance. Coach Robinson would stand about where he expected the ball to land so he could record the distance. When my first throw sailed over his head, he whirled around to make sure it was actually me who had thrown it. Read them and weep, boys, but hey, thanks for playing. Thanks to a few of the real athletes, we finally got a pennant for our company flag. Big whoop. Another thing about boot camp that was so much fun when watch standing at night in your barracks while everybody else slept. What is there for to watch for crying out loud? Every company had a watch bill, so each lucky recruit got to stand barracks watch on a regular basis. You got to wear a web belt, carry a flashlight, and roam around the barracks trying to stay awake, listening to people snore, talk in their sleep, moan and groan, thrash about, or whatever else passed for sleep. I would stare out the windows at the jets leaving San Diego airport, wishing to God I was on one. I did not enjoy boot camp. I would not do it again, given a choice. However, 
boot camp was a powerful motivation tool for me and is just what most teenagers actually need.